The ferry from Muig had been cancelled for the previous two days and they were being assessed on a sailing by sailing basis. We phoned Calmac from Invergari to check if the ferry from Muig was running and we were told that it was, so we booked it there and then. We picked up some groceries at Portree and before we knew it we arrived at Muig on the northwest coast of Skye. We were informed there that the ferry had been delayed and the sailing to Harris would be running an hour late. The two egg we had rain, then sun, then rain again. But the one thing that remained constant was a howling gale. And as the cars queued at the quayside, we wondered if the ferry would still be running. Then, as it was beginning to give up, the large Carmack ferry came into view. It was a welcome sight. We boarded the ferry, and we were soon on our way. It was quite a swell as we rounded the headland and ploughed our way out into the minch. At the outer edge of Europe, sitting remotely in the North Atlantic, a string of ancient islands called the Outer Hebrides, and the most northern island is Lewis. When we arrived at Tarbot, the weather was atrocious. It had poured incessantly for the full 40 mile trip from Tarbot to Carloway on the exposed west coast of the island. We were booked in for the three nights at the little black house village of Garanen, nestled in a little bay on the exposed west coast of the island, at the mercy of the full force of the crashing Atlantic breakers. We were met at the village by Mary, who handed me the key of the black house. We brought all the luggage and provisions in. Mary already had the underfloor heating on, so the house was lovely and warm. These snug little thatched cottages are made of Louisian Nice, some of the oldest rocks in the world. They have been carefully restored to create an authentic settlement. Visit Scotland have given this accommodation a four star rating and I wouldn't argue with that. The Garin and Trust have done themselves proud here. It was lovely and warm in the Black House, but we could still hear the wild conditions outside. As the dawn broke over the sleepy village of Carloway, we awoke after a great night's sleep. We wrapped up well and stepped out into the sharp highland morning. But it had clouded over now and the snow was on. I couldn't believe it. There was still a biting wind as well. Roberta made her last minute adjustments and we headed for the beach. Bad weather or not, it was still good to be back. Roberta decided to spend her time on the rocky shoreline while I headed for the craggy hillock above the rocks to get a better view of the area. The snow had stopped and the sun came out. I stood on the hillside and took in the atmospheric and exciting Lewis seascape. The heavy snow clouds were moving off into the distance while the rocks offshore were bathed in the cold spring sunshine as the wild Atlantic breakers crashed against the black rugged Carloway shoreline. I decided to discover the village where the girls cooked breakfast. There has been a settlement in this area for over 2,000 years, but the black houses here date back about 350 years. These islanders were crofters, rearing sheep and cattle. They lived off the land and the sea. The two world wars and the lack of local employment saw many of the younger islanders move elsewhere in search of work. Well, I realised it was time to head back to Thai Glass when I started to smell the bacon eggs and black pudding. I was starting to feel encouraged now. This was when we settled the weather had been since we arrived. We had had our breakfast and decided to take a trip into Stornoway. We were going to visit one or two other places of interest on the way there. A couple of miles from Garanen, at the south end of the village of Carloway, a little side road leads to the right to a cluster of half a dozen crofts. This little hamlet is typical of the many that are dotted along this stretch of coast. What makes this one different is it's named after one of Lewis's most famous relics. This is Duncarloway, the site of a remarkably well-preserved Pictish broch standing dramatically on a stunning location in a rocky outcrop overlooking Loch Rogue and the Atlantic beyond. The traces of the earlier snow showers could still be picked out around the base of the broch. The double walls are pretty well preserved, as is its stone staircase. Although the sun was shining, there was still a cool wind. Brochs are unique to Scotland, and the most commonly accepted theory was that being built in a time of turbulence, the structure was built as a means of defence. 
From above, it is noticeable that the most accessible parts of the broch have been removed, possibly to build the black houses nearby, leaving a life-size cutaway model which exposes much of the structure of the building. Built between about 50 BC and the 1st century, these brochs are some of the most impressive of our pre-Christian monuments. Duncarloway is a truly amazing structure and was well worth the visit. There are many stone circles scattered around this area, but few have the impact of the stones at Callanish. The island is rich in archaeological treasures. Standing stones are everywhere. Monoliths and Iron Age houses, mills and kilns, dunes and Pictish brochs. But the most evocative and haunting sight of all is the standing stones of Callanish. It's an atmospheric place. The physical presence of those tall monoliths fill the air with an overwhelming sense of mystery. The stones, made of the local Louisian niece, vary in height from about 1 to 5 metres tall. The stones have been the subject of speculation for years, probably hundreds of years. Five thousand years later this monument still stands as a credit to its builders. The reason for this circle has probably been guesswork for the last three or four thousand years. A few miles north brings us to a beautiful sheltered beach at Boster. The weather was a bit more settled now and it wasn't just as cold as earlier on, even in the coast. Boster is a beautiful, pure white, sheltered, sandy beach with wonderful vistas across a breathtaking surf-fringed aqua bay out towards the rugged stacks and islands that offer some protection from the wild Atlantic breakers. We climbed a little hillock above the shoreline and there in a little glen alongside the sandy beach is an excellent example of an Iron Age dwelling. The reconstruction of a roundhouse, built next to the foundations of the original Iron Age village, which dates back to about the 6th or 7th century, exposed when the full force of an Atlantic storm uncovered the remains about 15 years ago. I first stumbled in this little gem a few years ago and dived into the thatched building to get out of the rain. You can imagine my shock when I bumped into an islander sitting by a peat fire waiting to show visitors around. Inside the house is a figure of eight giving two rooms. The back section was built a shade lower. The Iron Age houses that were uncovered here were all interlinked by an underground tunnel system. The intrepid travellers made their way back up the sandy path and headed off back to the car. When we arrived at Stornoway, the first place we headed for was Charlie McLeod's butcher shop for some of his world famous black pudding. The name Stornoway, or Stjornavig, is derived from the Old Norse for Steering Bay. It certainly dates back to Viking times, but archaeological remains from Neolithic times have been found in the vicinity. It is the best natural harbour in the Western Isles. Stornoway, with a population of over 7,000, is the only town in the Outer Hebrides. It is the main hub of the island and by far the largest settlement in the Western Isles and is a bustling and attractive town. The extensive busy harbour remains the focal point of the town and still has a significant fishing fleet. On the way home we stopped at the village of Bragger where the jawbone of an 85 foot blue whale forms an unusual gateway. It was getting dark by the time we get back to Gyaranen, so we decided to stay in for the night, watch the football and have a few beers. We parked the car and made our way to tie glass with our wares. It was much milder than the previous night. It was actually a very pleasant evening. It was a very early rise in Monday morning to catch the early ferry. We were up at half past four in the morning, and to make matters worse, the clocks had just been put forward on the previous day. Dawn was just starting to break as we drifted off from the quayside. I still get the same sad feeling when I leave. Nothing changes. <laughs>